In the city of Jerusalem, whispers of anticipation are heard everywhere. The streets are alive with the news of the imminent arrival of Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus sends two of his disciples to fetch a donkey and its colt. He rides into Jerusalem, fulfilling what was foretold by the prophet Zechariah. As Jesus enters the city, a large crowd gathers to greet him, spreading their cloaks and palm branches on the road in a display of honor and reverence. The atmosphere is one of celebration. This is Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah, the embodiment of hope and salvation for a weary world. The people cheer. They shout, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And whether they know it or not, as Jesus passes by them, they are witnessing the face of God in the humanity of this man on this borrowed donkey. This Easter, you're invited to discover the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and to experience the overwhelming gift of grace and salvation that's being offered through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. All right, our kids are dismissed to their classes. If you're in here with me, would you open your Bibles to the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. Luke 19, and we will begin reading in verse 28. If you're able to stand for the reading of God's word, would you please stand with me? Luke chapter 19, verse 28. When you got it, say so. <clears throat> it says, and when he had said this, he went on, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he drew near Bethpage and Bethany at the mount called Olivet that he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you where you enter and at where as you enter you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, Why are you loosing the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of them. Then they brought him to Jesus, brought him to Jesus and they threw their clothes on the colt, and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then, as he was drawing near the descent of, of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud, loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you, and your children within you, to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Then he went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it, saying to them, it is written, my house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him and were unable to do anything, for all the people were very attentive to hear him. Father, thank you so much for the great demonstration of your love that we have in the sacrifice of your son. Thank you today that we get to look back 
and retrace the steps that our Savior walked and the things that he did beginning today as we start this journey in Holy Week, Lord God. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak, that you would illuminate our minds, that you would illuminate our hearts. And Lord, that this would be the beginning of of our eyes being opened to your truth, Lord. We thank you for this, and we pray against all distractions of mind and heart. May we be receptive hearers and doers of your word. We ask this all in Jesus' strong name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. If you do not have an outline, just raise your hand, and the ushers will be sure to get you an outline. We want to be sure that you are able to follow along in the introduction and that you're able to take some notes. Um, So keep your hand up, and the ushers will be sure to get you an outline. So today is the beginning of Holy Week. And so if you're not familiar with Holy Week, right, it's the week where we celebrate. We start with Palm Sunday, which is today, and we have some different activities activities throughout the week. And so I just encourage you, if you have not signed up, if you haven't uh, signed up for the Seder meal, if you haven't made plans to be here for the Tenebrae service on Friday, uh, those things are, are really important. They really highlight some beautiful and key moments in the in the journey that Jesus had on his way to the cross. Um, also Saturday, a Can I Pray For You campaign, that's going to be something that wasn't necessarily part of Holy Week, hallelujah, but it is something that we're going to do to enjoy and, and hopefully minister to our community. And then obviously next Sunday, we have our Easter gathering, the celebration, the resurrection of Jesus. And for those of you that have been paying attention, you know that we have two services next Sunday. So we'll have one service at nine o'clock and another service at 11. So please be sure to sign up for one of them and uh, make it a point, you know, to bring your guests with you to that particular service. And if you're able to serve in the other service, that would also be helpful. But nonetheless, as we're looking at the journey through Holy Week, Palm Sunday is it's, it's a Sunday, and today I want to I just talk about Palm Sunday reminds us. What does Palm Sunday remind us of? Palm Sunday begins the Holy Week journey, and in it we see so much and are reminded of powerful truths that should keep us focused upon the Lord and the events that span the final week of his life before the cross. There's so much packed into these passages of Scripture, and I, I encourage you in this week to sit, to sit down and, and read the different um, retellings in the Gospels of of what Jesus' um, this last week of his life before the cross was like. So you can reflect on these and hopefully utilize the notes that you'll take today and the things you hear today to help you do that. Uh, when we look at this, this journey allows us to better relate with Jesus as we seek to please the Lord in all that we do. That's the, the vision of our church, right, is to please God in everything that we do. That's what we want to do. And as we seek to please him and seek to honor Honor him, it is important that we're able to focus in on him, that we're able to think about what Jesus has done, especially in the face of hardships associated with fulfilling God's purposes. How many of you know following Jesus isn't easy? Some, some, some folks may have, may have been lied to and they thought, well, coming to Jesus was the easy way. No, it's the right way, not the easy way. Hello. It's not, it's not always easy following the Lord. And as we go through difficulty, as we go through trial, as we go through hardship, as we go through these different things in our lives, what is it that is going to keep us f- uh, able to move, move forward? Well, the book of Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that we are to focus upon looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, the one who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Hallelujah. And so when we look at these moments of Holy Week, it's an opportunity for us to just pause and just think about what Jesus went through. Think about what Jesus endured. For those of you that weren't here this morning, as Pastor Rod prayed, he prayed what courage, what courage it was for Jesus to actually do the thing that we just read about, to to not run away from his death. Pastor Aldo, in his exhortation, he said, look, when I wasn't running toward God, I was running away from him. I was, I, I, I was sharing with, with, with someone, we, we were having a conversation, and, and, and as we were talking, I said, you know, if we look back on some things in our lives, we may say, man, I would have never, I, w- I wouldn't redo that again, right? I wouldn't do that over again. And I'm like, that's the reason why God doesn't show you what's going to happen, because you wouldn't go that way. Hello. 
If God showed you every way that you were going to stumble and every way you were going to trip and every way that you were going to get hurt and every way that you were going to be offended and every way that you were, you name it, you would be, I'm not, why would I go that way? None of us wants to go the hard way. We all want to go the easiest way, right? We, we, we you know, if, if you use a, a, a system, right, your, a GPS system and you're trying to go somewhere, you look at the different routes, right? And you look at the fastest route, glory to God. And, and generally, the fastest route is the, the route that has least traffic. Hello. <laughs> if, 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 you, if anybody drove during, during spring break, praise the name of the Lord. Your faith was tested many ways in this, in this driving, right? Uh, it, it, it's, it, the, the point is, we're not, we're, we're, not, we're not desirous to go through the difficult stuff, and yet our Savior in this moment is, is on his way knowing exactly what's going on. And we're going to see this clearly as we unpack this text. But he knew exactly where he was going. He knew exactly where he was heading. There was no question, and he didn't cower. He didn't turn away from the thing that was set before him, but for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. For the joy that was set before him, he, he continued on this path. And so the thing I want you to think about this morning is our effort to remember what Jesus experienced for us will influence what we endure for him. Our effort to remember what Jesus experienced for us will influence what we endure for him. Why, why, why do we keep on keeping on? Because we just have that in us? Because we were raised, you know, away, our dad, our, our mom, our, you know, our family, we, we don't quit, right? That's what we learned, you know? Uh, you know. It's something, it's a value that we teach our kids, right? Uh, we don't quit. We don't give up on hard stuff. We keep pressing on. If we say yes, we say yes. We continue on until we finish whatever that commitment is. Those are all good things. But what is the thing that keeps you as a Christian, that keeps me as a follower of Jesus? What is it that keeps us? moving forward, and it is when we really focus on and we remember what it is that Jesus endured for us, we'll endure for him. We will do what it is that he's called us to do. We will continue to move forward. And so the first thing I'll ask you to repeat after me is this. Say, Palm Sunday reminds us that God is sovereign over his creation. Palm Sunday reminds us that God is sovereign over his creation. Some pretty cool stuff that we see here and, and beginning, and, and we'll walk through this. But as, as we look at this, Luke emphasizes certain things. And, and we have to remember, right, that, that each of the writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're all writing to a specific audience. And Luke is writing to Gentiles. And so if you read through the, the synoptic gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you'll notice that they each have different details in there when it comes to this particular retelling of the story. The same thing with John. He has some different details there. But, but nonetheless, the, the point is that, that Luke is emphasizing certain things for his Gentile audience. And one important component is, is, is the cult being reserved by Jesus and, 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 that, and the fact that it hadn't been written, this is really, really important stuff, right? So just read with me, verse 28. It says, when he had said this, so Jesus had just come from Zacchaeus' house, and he had just finished uh, telling them uh, this parable of the ten minas and, and, and explaining to them that, 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 that man, there, there's, there, there is a, a way that we should be living as faithful stewards, and after this, he decides it's time for him to make his way. And so he begins to make his way towards Jerusalem. And so he goes toward Jerusalem. And, and just to notice, Luke is, 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 is not showing you Jesus in Jerusalem yet. He's showing what is happening on the way to Jerusalem. This is the pathway as he's making his way there. And he said, and it came to pass when he drew near Bethpage and Bethany at the mount called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you, where, where, where as you enter, you will find a cult tied on which no one has ever sat. That's an important a point there that no one has ever sat there. Now, I don't know if you've ever, ever watched, but you know, animals, they don't, you know, animals that you would ride on, if they've never been ridden before, they have to be broken. Hello. So you're not, you're not, you, you, you're not going to go out in the wild. Like, so just say you're out in the wild somewhere and you see a, a couple of horses. Don't just think you're going to walk up and just jump on there and you got a free ride. No, no, no. Right? This is not going to happen, right? You, the, the horse has to be broken in order for it to be ridden, right? The same thing for this colt. It's not just going to let somebody just sit on it, right? So, so the, this is an important component here for us to think about when we're looking at what Jesus is communicating. 
And he says, loosen and bring it here. <clears throat> and if anyone asks you, why are you, loosening, uh, why are you loosening it? Thus you shall say to them, because the Lord, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, Why are you loosing the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus, and they threw their own clothes on the colt, and, and they set Jesus on him. And so I, I want you to notice there's two things that we see here. First of all, we see that the, the owners of this colt had a responsibility, did they not? It was their colt. They could have easily said, Leave that colt alone. That's not yours. And, and, and yet, because they knew Jesus, they knew who the, the disciples were talking about, they, they understood as, as the owners of this cult that even what we own doesn't belong to us, but it belongs to the Lord. So it wasn't just the cult that, 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 that exhibits the understanding of God's sovereignty, but it's actually the owners of the cult first who exhibit an understanding that the Lord owns it all. Now, here's my question for us, right? Because I want to just walk through a little Bible study Sunday school lesson here. Is that how you live? Is, is that the way that you live your life, that, that everything you own belongs to the Lord? Now, let me just say this. This is easy to say yes to, when we're not asking, like if I walked out of the, of the building right now and I went out there and I started, you know, looking at cars and then I walked up to your vehicle and I started to open it up and then you're like, yo, yo, what are you doing? We're like, the Lord has need of your vehicle. <laughs> well, hold up, Bishop, you know, like, I don't know. You know I, 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 don't you have a vehicle? You know, like, you know, there'd be some questions, right, that we will be having some conversation, right, about that. So I, I use that as an illustration, but the reality is, how do we live our lives? I mean, do we, do you live your life as though God really owns it all? Like, like when, when, when you know that there's a need, are you immediate to say, hold on, I got to meet that need because what I have doesn't belong to me, but it belongs to the Lord. Right? Do we do we live that way, or, or do we just we just give lip service to that? Right? Like, oh yeah, everything I have belongs to the Lord. Really? I'll leave it there. I'll let you think about it. But the truth is that that we are supposed to live our lives like the owners of this cult live. That 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 the, everything that the Lord has need of it. So, what does the Lord have need of in your life? I don't know what He has need of. Is there, it, 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 but, but are you willing to, to be submitted the way that these owners were of this? They were submitted and they gave what they had unto the Lord for him to utilize it. And then the second thing, I already said this, but I'll just repeat this. The, the, the cult itself had never be written, been written. It cooperates. Again, what does it recognize? Who's sitting, who's sitting on me? The Lord has sat on me. The Lord has sat on me. And now I submit to him and I will bring him wherever he needs to go, right? So again, there, there's the sovereignty. When we're looking at this story, what is Luke pointing out? What is the right, what are the writers trying to tell? The writers are telling us God is sovereign. God is, he rules. He, he, it's not just lip service. He is God. He sat on this call. Nobody else was going to go and do that. And yet he does this. And we see, I mean, this thing doesn't just like move two steps. I mean, this thing walks him a long way, carrying him all the way into Jerusalem with no problem, no hiccup, no issue there, recognizing the sovereign one has seated there. Again, the question is, are you like this cult? Or are you still being broken? Are, 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 you, are, are you still dealing with selfishness? Are, are, are you still dealing with pride? Are, are, are you still dealing with attitudes that don't bring glory and honor to God? Are you still saying, this is my life? Really, is it? Or, or, or is the Lord sovereign? Is he reigning? Is he ruling as king, as ruler, as Lord over every area, not just some areas, but every area of your life, are you being the carrier of the glory of God that you're supposed to be, right? I read the text last week in, in 1 Peter where, where we have been called out of darkness into the marvelous light of the kingdom of God to proclaim his praises unto this world that desperately needs to see that. But if Jesus is not Lord, we're hindering the picture, are we not? If I'm still Lord of my life, if, if, if I'm still the one who rules, if I'm still the one who calls the shots, 
then am I hindering? Obviously, I'm hindering what people are seeing. They're not seeing the Lord the way that they should. So we see that in the, in the owners, and we see that God's sovereignty in, in this. And then we go on in verse 36. We see that over the cult as well. And then verse 36, and he says, and he went, and he went, and he went, and he went uh, many spread their clothes on the road. Peculiar action. Then, as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works. In another translation, it says all of the miracles they had seen. See, this is, this is a moment where there is a kingly procession that is happening. This is when, when they threw their clothing in the palm branches, where we get the idea of Palm Sunday. That when they did that, they were saying something in their actions. They were saying someone of royalty is arriving. It's, it, it's, it's akin to rolling out the red carpet. That's what they were doing in this moment. So, so they were physically doing something, and, and, and what was happening was just, uh, just uh, if you're taking notes, because Luke, again, remember, Luke is writing to a Gentile audience, so meaning that the, the Gentiles who are reading this, they, they're, they're probably not proficient in Old Testament prophecy, so he leaves out some prophetic words, but, but, in, but in Matthew, in the other, in, in the other account there, he, he quotes this one from, uh, from um, Zechariah chapter 9. Zechariah chapter 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, listen to this, your king is coming to you. He is just in having salvation, lowly in riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So, so G, now, now you got you to picture this now. Jesus knows who he is. Jesus knows what time it is in the, in, 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 the, in the time frame of his destiny while he is in the flesh on this earth. And he does something specific. He comes on this cult. He was specific about what he was doing because he is making a proclamation of who he is. Again, he is saying, I am the king who is coming to you with salvation. I am the king who is arriving on the scene with salvation. I'm coming lowly and I'm coming humble. I'm doing these things so that we all of you Jews who know the Old Testament prophecies and who you are waiting for, oh, I'm the one. Jesus is making this declaration. He is making it abundantly clear in his actions in this moment. He's saying, I'm the one. I'm the one they've been waiting for. I'm the one you guys have been talking about. I'm the one you guys have been thinking about. He's making it crystal clear. He's making it clear to them so that way they know. And then the people go on as they're there and they begin to cry out, blessed is the king. In the other translations you, 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 or, or the other accounts, you see Hosanna, who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And, 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 and we see that there is this praise, this glory, and everything that is going on. And so what do we see here? First of all, Jesus is making it clear by what he did, who he is. The people are making it clear by what they did. They know who he is. So first of all, they're, they're, they're throwing down the palm branches in their clothes on the floor saying, come in, O king. They're crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're crying out in worship. They're, 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 they're speaking the messianic language, right? The, the Feast of Tabernacles, Psalm 118. They're, they're making these declarations that, that, that Israel knows about. And so they're doing this knowledgeably. And again, Jesus is making a declaration. The people are recognizing him as royalty and action and in their declaration. And lastly, I want you to see this in verse 39. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, teacher, rebuke your disciples. In other words, can you believe what they're saying? Do you believe what they're saying? Do, do you think that you are the Hosanna, the one to save? Do you think that you are the king that is coming? They knew what, that, what was going on. Again, I want you to see it clearly. There should be no question. When people try to say like, oh, no, they weren't sure who Jesus was. Oh, they knew who Jesus was. Oh, Jesus never made a de- Oh, Jesus made declarations. But, but what does Jesus say to them? Jesus comes to them and says, listen, if they don't cry out, the stones will. In other words, this is inevitable. Hello. This is, this, you know, up until this point, I want you to notice this. Up until this point, every time Jesus does a miracle, what does he tell people? Shh. Don't say anything. My time is not yet. 
Don't listen, go give, go give praise to God. Don't say anything. Don't, don't spread my, my name around because my time is not yet. When his mom comes to him at the, at the wedding, right? My mom, my time is not yet. All this time, Jesus never accepts praise until this moment. In this moment, Jesus is saying, oh yeah, it's time. My time is now because when y'all start praising me, these people are going to go bananas. These, these religious people are going to go nuts because they're not going to be able to handle this. And uh, inevitably, that, that, that is part of what provokes them beyond where they could just say, man, we got to do something. We can't just let them continue on. And so finally, until now, again, it is time for Jesus' glorification. That's what it is. It's time for him to be glorified. Now, the second thing I want you to repeat after me is this. Say, Palm Sunday reminds us, Palm Sunday reminds us that, God that God is committed, is committed to his people. Palm Sunday reminds us that God is committed to his people. The climax of of Luke's gospel in this particular moment is this of what happens next. Jesus is still, he's not in Jerusalem yet. It says in verse 41, it says, now as he drew near, he's still drawing near, he saw the city. And when he sees this city, the scripture says he wept over it. And, th- and these are his words. Listen, listen to his words as he, as he weeps over the city Jerusalem. If you had known, even you, especially in your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embarkment an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground and they will not leave you and leave in you one stone upon another. And he gives this reason, and I'm gonna come back to this, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Two times we see Jesus crying. Once at Lazarus' tomb. Shortest verse in the Bible, you know that, hallelujah. (laughs) Jesus wept. Doesn't tell us why he wept. I don't don't, don't think personally that he was crying because he was nervous about Lazarus being dead. I I, I think he was in that moment, again, this is just my opinion on this. I think that he was feeling the emotion of the moment that everybody was feeling around there. It wasn't because of him, it was because of them. So he has this compassion that is there. But in this moment, it is crystal clear why he is weeping. The second time that Jesus weeps. And now he's weeping over Jerusalem. Funny because Jerusalem is supposed to be the city of peace. The city that would be known for peace, and yet he is weeping over them because they won't know peace. That's crazy. The place where where the peace of God should reign the most, the place that should be known for, for the peace of God coming from it in the people of God that are there, is a place that he says you won't know peace. You will not know peace. Jesus, again, and just so you know, for you history guys and and gals, right, uh, uh, in AD 70 is when this prophetic word was fulfilled, when they totally destroyed Jerusalem and and, and made it an absolute rubble at that time. This prophecy was fulfilled. They were destroyed. But, but, but when we're looking at this, Jesus is weeping over them. And, and, and again, I said I would come back to this, but this, these last words mess me up. Because you missed your time of visitation. We just read a couple of verses earlier. They were throwing palm branches on the floor. They were putting their clothing on the floor because of the miracles they saw. We just looked at the fact that they were crying out, Hosanna, which means save us, O son of David. They they understood who Jesus was clearly, and yet Jesus is weeping because even though they knew all of that, even though they had seen miracle after miracle, even though they had heard his preaching that was with authority, even though there was no question of all the prophetic words that were fulfilled through Jesus, yet they missed the moment when Jesus visited. And again, I don't want to just give you a Bible story. Are you missing God's moment of visitation to you. In your life, is God knocking on the door and you're ignoring? 
Are you continuing to live how you want to live, do things according to your will, according to your wisdom, according to how you think or what you think is right? Are you continuing on your own path and missing and saying, oh, yeah, oh, I, I believe, amen, yeah, bishop, oh, yeah, amen. Oh, I love when they sing that song. You could be doing all of that and yet miss God's visitation. And, and it's not because I'm saying it, it's because it happened. Hello. And you know, you, you, know, you know why? Now listen to me. You know why they missed their moment of visitation, right? Because Jesus didn't do it the way they wanted him to. See, that's our problem. When God doesn't answer our prayers the way that we want him to answer our prayers, we suddenly think, oh, he's not answering. Oh, when, when God doesn't do it the way that we want him to do it, the way that we think he should do it, when he doesn't respond how we think he should, all of a sudden, he's not worthy. All of a sudden, he's not God. All of a sudden, he's not trustworthy. Well, I want you to know that you're in bad company. I can't even say good company. But I will say you are well accompanied. Because even in this time, they were there, and when they were crying out, Hosanna, son of David, they were saying, Lord, all right, we're, we are acknowledging you are king. We're acknowledging you are Lord. So now, because we have acknowledged that you are Lord, here's what you have to do. You have to overturn the Roman Empire completely, and you've got to establish your reign and your rule in Jerusalem, and you have to raise us up as your chosen nation, and, and you have to do these things these way because this is the Messiah we're waiting for. I want you to know that Messiah is coming. Because there is a Messiah who came, the one we're talking about, lowly and humble. There is another one that is coming on a white horse with a sword in his mouth, and you don't want to meet that one. You want to be in the back of that one saying, yes, go, Lord, hallelujah, yes, get him. You want to be on that side. You don't want to be on the receiving end of what's coming when that Messiah comes. He is coming. But the reason why they missed their moment of visitation was because after they did all that praise, after they made all that noise, Jesus didn't go and overturn the Roman Empire and establish his reign and rule, but he decided to do something else, go to a cross and die. And so church, it is so important for us to recognize Man, the Lord could be visiting, the Lord could be answering your prayer, and he could be saying no. You know that is an answer as well. Amen? Yeah. I mean, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm just like everyone else in this room, man. You know, when I come to the Lord and I have a petition before him, you know, we were, we, we were, we were talking about somebody the, the, um, the other day in a meeting that I was in. And in this meeting, there, there was somebody there that they were potentially dealing with some sickness. And, and this is what they said in the meeting. They were like, so the prayer is that this thing is, and it was a, it was a tumor that they found, the, the prayer is that it's benign. That's the prayer. And I thought about this, and I said, how on the earth can you pray that prayer? You are dictating what you want God to do in that situation. I'm, I'm like, I don't, I, as I thought about it later on, I'm like, how can I agree with that prayer? I don't know that that's God's will. But what I do know is that I can pray God's mercy in that situation. And I can pray, God, I don't know what that thing is. I don't know if it's benign. I don't know if it's malignant. But I know that you are above all of it. And so whatever the response, I, I can't ask God. Listen, I feel like that, and this is me. I feel like that would be me like trying to twist God's arm and then me believing God for, he, for something he never gave me a promise for. And so, my friends, we, we, we have, to, we have to, to, to humble ourselves unto the one who is God and say, Lord, you work out these things as you will. I submit to your will. Help me to be like this cult. that didn't See, the cult didn't miss his day of visitation or her day. I don't know if it was a guy or a girl, but anyway. Huh. They, 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 they didn't miss that. When, when the Lord came, oh, let's go. <laughs> Where you want to go, Lord? He didn't miss it. The owners of the cult didn't miss it, but the people in Jerusalem did. And you know what? And, and here, here, here's the bottom line. The bottom line is, and hear me when I say this, God is committed to you. Are you here? He is committed to your good and you knowing his peace. That's what he wants for all of us. 
Even, even if he doesn't answer the way that we want him to answer, he is committed to you, he is committed to your good, and he wants you to know his peace. He wants you to be whole. And so you have to ensure your heart is open to him. Ensure you are obeying his word. Ensure that you are living in the light or you too risk missing your moment of visitation. See, when I, when, when, when I read words like this, I, I'm going to be honest. I don't think about you. I think about me. I'm like, man, Lord, have I missed a moment of your visitation? Have I, have I been so busy that, that I've missed you? Have I been so consumed by X, Y, and Z that I missed you? Have, have I been so concerned with whatever it is that I miss you? I think about me when I read these words, and then when I know I've got to preach it to you, I think about you, right? Like, God, let us not miss you. Let, let us, let, 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 let the people of God not miss you. Let them not miss your visitation. Let them not miss your knock. Let them not miss your still small voice. Let them not miss you in the midst of hardship and difficulty. Let them not miss you. Church, I don't want us to miss him. I don't want us to miss him. And so I encourage you to encourage one another to be in the position of obeying, a position of an open heart, and to be in a position that you are living in the light, that you're not living a double life or a fake life. Third thing, I'll ask you to repeat after me is this. Say, Palm Sunday reminds us that God is faithful to his word. As we, as we walk through the text and we come to the closing portion of this passage, we see here in verse 45, then he went into the temple. And so it, it is probable that this was actually Monday, not, not, not Sunday. It's probably the next day after he's in Jerusalem because you look at the other gospels, it's, it's the next morning when he gets up after the tree was, the fig tree was cursed because it didn't uh, you know, have fruit on it when he went to the tree. It's probably that next day when he's going into the temple. And when he's going into the temple, Jesus, Jesus goes into the temple, and what does he do? He begins to drive out those who bought and sold in it, saying to them, it is written. Again, it is written. God's word has said this. My house is a house of prayer. And, 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 and Fuller, Fuller um, says uh, in, in the other gospels, it says, a house of prayer to all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people, they sought to destroy him and were unable to do anything for all the people were very attentive to hear him. Now, it's funny because when you read that, you would think like he was there forever, but it was just a couple of days that the people were listening to him teach because by Thursday, he is with his disciples and Friday, he is on the cross in the tomb, but, but in these few days that he's there, he's teaching in the temple. And so what do we have here? Again, Palm Sunday reminds you that God is faithful to his word. Jesus finally makes it into Jerusalem, then into the temple. And, and two things happen. The first thing that he does is he cleanses the temple. And the second thing he does is he teaches the people between Monday and Thursday. So the first thing he does, he cleanses the temple. Why does he cleanse the temple? Because the religious system had become corrupt. The, the people that were there, they were coming to Jerusalem to worship God during this festival time. And when you traveled from a long, you know, a, long, a long way away, guess what? You weren't bringing your animals with you. What did you do? When you got to Jerusalem, when you got there to where the temple was, you were able to purchase these animals for sacrifice so you could worship. Well, guess what? People were like, huh, they're coming a long way. We can up these prices. Hello. It's kind of like toilet paper during hurricane season. Hello. <laughs> no, because everybody just, forget water. They just want toilet paper for whatever reason. It's like everybody has to stock up on toilet. Anyway, I don't know, but there it is. But water as well, right? I mean, they take it all. But, but nonetheless, they're, they're, they were like, hey, we can, we, we, we can make some profits here because they're at our mercy they don't know where else to go. They're not going to go anywhere else. They're coming to us for these things. And guess what? They, they, they corrupted the system. But here's the problem. The problem is, where were the Pharisees? Where were the priests? Where were the religious leaders who were correcting this? Oh, they weren't correcting it. They were probably pocketing some too as well. 
Something was going on. They were allowing this corruption to continue to happen. They were hindering the worship of God. Why, and why, why, I mean, why does this matter so much to Jesus that he's got to flip the tables on them? Well, because he, he's disgusted, but not just that. But they are hindering worship. And, and, and more specifically, they are hindering the understanding of the Lamb of God that is coming for them. They're hindering that because they're overpaying and, they're, and, and God is coming to them. They're, they're being robbed because a den of thieves, that's what Jesus says. They're being robbed, but God is trying to bring them a gift. And Jesus is trying to fix the picture, so I think that's what he was doing and as he was teaching, teaching about what this sacrificial system should be, about what the church, well, not the church, but what the people of God should be doing in this moment. But again, I don't want to just give you a Sunday school lesson. I want us to think about this because as the body of Christ, here's the thing, church, we must ensure that we are not doing anything that would hinder, distort, or detract from the worship of God. Are you here? We, as the body of Christ, have to be sure that we are not doing anything, anything that would hinder, that would would distort, that would distract, that, that would take away from us proclaiming the praises of the one who redeemed us. See, church, we're living in a moment where the church is not looking so pretty right now. So many, so many, so many different, so many different divisions in the church, so many, so many different ideas for the church. And 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 we get we 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 get off track and we lose focus on what the main thing is. <clears throat> and that is to bring glory and to bring honor to the one who died for us. That is to bring glory and praise to the one who shed holy blood in our place. To do everything we can to make sure, again, that he is enthroned in our lives so that way we are not a hindrance from people seeing him in us. That the way that we live produces what? That people look and they, they see our good works is what Jesus says when he's preaching in the, in, in the, in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. That, that men would see our good works and that they would praise God. That, that, they, that they would recognize. The Apostle Peter says that we would live these quiet lives in a way so that way when they come to accuse us, man, they'll be made a fool of. That's a paraphrase, by the way. But that, but that they will be ashamed because what they've said about y'all Christian folk is not true. See, here's the thing. We, we can't do anything to, to change the view of the world on the church, but we can do something to change the view of our world about the church. See, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm never going to change, probably not here, I'm never going to change what, what people in another county might think about the church, but what about the people in my neighborhood? And what they think about the church. Can I do something to change that? The, 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 the people who you work with, can you do something to change the way they think about the church by the way that you live, by the way that you honor God? Okay, church, that's our responsibility. God is not asking you to change the view of the world. God is simply saying, be faithful. Don't be a hindrance to, to pointing to who Jesus is. Here's my closing question for you. Jesus walked into Jerusalem, and, here's, and, and he went on his way to the cross. And as we continue in this week together in this journey, Jesus was going somewhere. And so here's the question. Are you willing to follow Jesus no matter where he leads you? Are you willing to follow Jesus no matter where he leads you? As you think about that, It may seem easy to say yes, but again, I want you to ask yourself this question. What is it that Jesus is asking of you right now? Because I've heard it said like this. People say all the time they're willing to die for Jesus, and yet they won't live for him. 
So again, the question is, will you follow the Lord wherever he leads you? I would hope the answer is yes, but the test to that is what is it that God is asking of you right now? What is it that you know that he's requiring of you? Is there something he's telling you, let that go? Is there something he's telling you, walk away from that? Is there something he's telling you, continue on this path? Continue doing what you are doing. Is, is, is there something? Because listen, if you're not willing to do that thing, you're not willing to follow him anywhere. It's easy to say, yeah, I'm going to die for him. Yes, I'll follow him to wherever he takes me. But will you just live for him right where you are right now? To me, that's what Palm Sunday is about. It's about following him. It's about recognizing that he is 100% sovereign, that he is 100% committed to his people, and that he is faithful to his word. Would you stand with me, please? Hey there, thank you so much for joining us this Sunday. I hope that your time with us was helpful. Hope that your time with us was edifying to you. And I just want to say thank you for all of your support. Thank you for the likes. Thank you for the shares. Thank you for the comments. If you are joining us for the first time online, would you please do us a favor and either email me at bishop at corefaithchurch.org. That is bishop at corefaithchurch.org. So I can thank you for being with us, get to know you a little bit better. Or if you have a prayer request, you can also email me there. Or if you're on Facebook, you can go ahead Ahead and you can leave us a message here uh, directly in the comment section, or you can send us an instant message and we'll get that and respond to you as soon as we can. Lastly, I want to say thank you to all of your to all of you for your financial support. And if you would like to contribute to Core Faith financially, there's a simple way to do it. You can give electronically. All you have to do is text Core Faith. That is one word. Core Faith to 73256. That is Core Faith, one word, to 73256, and then follow the prompts, and you can be a financial supporter of the mission that God has given us. And if you are supporting us financially, I want to say thank you so much. I pray that God will bless you abundantly. God bless you. Hope to see you next week.